and throughout the years we have experienced together the thrill of bringing this country's preeminent writers to meet with us in person and talk about their works. Tonight is no exception. Next year, we'll be featuring investigative journalist and Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award winner Catherine Boo, author of Behind the Beautiful Forevers, Life, Death, and Hope in a Mumbai Undercity, and Harvard sociologist and 2017 Pulitzer Prize winter, winner Matthew Desmond, author of Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City. Two terrific events in the spring, and then in the fall, we have Zadie Smith, more on that later. We chose Why Fiction Matters as our Arlington Reads theme because we can all agree that over the past year, truth and those who jo whose job it is to unearth it have taken and continue to take a bashing. So there's a certain irony in our looking to fiction writers for the illumination of what is real. Tonight, it's an honor to welcome Lawrence Block, who has been writing crime, mystery, and suspense fiction for more than half a century. Known as a writer's writer, he has published in excess of 100 books and many short stories. I commend one of his latest books to you, Last Falls in Sunlight or in Shadow, a collection of short stories inspired by the paintings of Edward Hopper and written by Stephen King, Joyce Carol Oates, among others. We're joined by one more page this evening. They've got plenty of books, including this one for sale. Again, they've been a terrific partner. From Mr. Block's website, I learned that he was born in Buffalo, New York, and attended Antioch College, but left before completing his studies. School authorities advised him that they felt he'd be happier elsewhere, <laughs> and he thought this was remarkably perceptive of them. His earliest work, published pseudonymously in the late 1950s, was mostly in the field of mid-century erotica, an apprenticeship he shared with writers Donald Westlake and Robert Silverberg. Block's awards are many. He is a Grand Master of Mystery Writers of America and a past president of MWA and the Private Eye Writers of America. He has won the Edgar and Seamus Awards four times each and the Japanese Maltese Falcon Award twice as well as the Nero Wolf and Philip Marlowe Awards, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Private Eye Writers of America, and the Diamond Dagger for Life Achievement from the Crime Writers Associations. He was also presented with the key to the city of Muncie, Indiana, but according to his website, as soon as he left, they changed the locks. <laughs> I first became acquainted with the work of Lawrence Block about 25 years ago when a friend, knowing of my affection for the hard-boiled detective fiction of Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, Mickey Spillane, and the late Elmore Leonard, pressed a novel into my hands and demanded that I read it. That book was When the Sacred Gin Mill Closes, and it was unlike any detective story I had ever read. Replete with betrayals, burglaries, and booze, the novel, the sixth in a series, is a flashback story of ex-cop Matthew Scudder, who spends his day doing favors for friends and drinking coffee laced with bourbon in the seedy Irish bars of New York City's West Side. The dialogue was pitch perfect, the setting gritty, the plot tangled, but not too much so. What hooked me, however, was the character of Matthew Scudder himself. I expected deeply flawed, someone somewhere between a good guy and a bad guy, what I didn't expect was the lost soul, the romantic who knows things went south, but doesn't exactly know when or how. The lonely guy who knows he's in trouble and puts money in the church collection box, perhaps to hedge his bets. And every man searching for the same things we all search for, love, redemption, and most of all, forgiveness, especially of ourselves. I won't spoil it by telling you the ending, Suffice it to say, it's a book that should be on everyone's to-read list. Anyone, that is, who calls himself or herself a serious reader. Please give a warm Arlington welcome to the legendary Lawrence Block. Thank you so much. Thank you.
thank you all so much, and, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, now what? No, <clears throat> I have to figure out what to talk about. <laughs> I, uh, I asked Diane earlier, you know, what should I talk about? And she said, talk about 30 or 35 minutes. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll endeavor to do that. Um, and as, as far as topic is concerned, um, I stopped worrying about that a long time ago when I heard uh, the words of uh, the Reverend Ike, uh, a legendary preacher in New York City, who said that he never, he made it a point, never to let his, his topic get in the way of what he had to say. <laughs> so. Uh, We'll be guided by that. I was thinking, uh, I was thinking earlier, something was flying at me. Um, I was thinking earlier about, oh, I, <clears throat> an event I was at, and I think it was a signing, I think the book I was signing was When the Sacred Gin Well Closes, because it wouldn't have been about 1985 or 86. And it was a dual appearance that I was making with someone I'd never met before at a mystery bookshop called Scene of the Crime, which was in somewhere in Southern California, somewhere in the LA area. It's long gone. And the uh, person I was uh, appearing with was Sue Grafton, who was there with her second book, uh, B is for Burglar. And we were talking. It was easy to talk, because there weren't that many people who'd come to get books signed by either. <laughs> and, um, and Sue was very clear that this was her second book about Kinsey Milhone, and she was going to go all the way through the alphabet and finish with Z. And uh, afterward, I turned to my wife and said, now how the hell can she know something like that? You know, how can she know that she'll be able to? How can she know that she'll want to? But she did know, and her vision was very clear. And she indeed most recently published, I think, uh, I believe Y is for Yesterday. And the next book will be Z. And um, then maybe she'll think of something else to do. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I, I, found, I found that remarkable, and it wasn't that she just decided this was the right way to, uh, to <clears throat> get rich and make a name for herself, because uh, Sue has always been characterized uh, by absolute integrity, artistic integrity. She's always written what she's wanted to write. Um, and in fact, <clears throat> was <clears throat> just as she knew she was going to do these 26 books, she also knew that uh, they were not to be uh, adapted for stage or screen or uh, anything else, that they were prose works and only that. And uh, she has never entertained any offers for dramatic rights. You know. uh, she knew that was what she wanted to do, and she was correct in that uh, vision also. All of this has been very different for me. I never know what the hell I'm going to do next and never have. And I'm uh, really grateful for that. Uh, and I thought I'd talk about a little tonight about how and where certain things have come from. Um, <clears throat> when the Sacred General closes, which Diane mentioned, was uh, the sixth book in uh, a series of which there have been about 12 since then. And the book's been written, the character <clears throat> evolves in real time. So the first book was written in the mid 70s and Matthew Scudder is 40 years older now than he is then because I made the decision to let him age in real time. 
That may or may not be a good idea with characters. <laughs> it's a terrible idea in one's own life, you know. <clears throat> Why I so arrange things that I'm now 40 years older than I was 40 years ago <laughs> is something I could not begin to explain. To you. Mistake. Um, but people have asked me, in the course of this, is, of course, Scudder's life has changed. He's an enormous uh, a heavy drinker, he's drinking alcoholically in the early books. In the fifth book, he stops drinking and his life continues and goes on and on as, uh, and goes through changes as human lives do. And people have said, now, when, did you, when you started writing the series, did you know uh, what the arc of it was going to be? Well, I never know what, what the next book is going to be. In fact, I rarely know what the book I'm writing is going to be. I, I certainly didn't have any vision of that. When I started writing the books, I thought Scotty would sit on the same chair in Armstrong's forever until he f fell off it and that would be the end. Um, part of the reason I write is to find out what's going to happen next. I think that's probably true for most writers. Um, but the Matthew Scudder series was at least conceived as a series. I wrote the first book knowing I was going to write at least two more. It was proposed as a series and I had that in mind at the beginning. Um, that's the only series of mine that was intentional. Others sort of happened. There, no, I, let, me, let me amend that. There was another series that was intentional, uh, but it only went for one book. I, I had an idea, or has the idea with my then agent or whatever, about uh, <clears throat> a book of a group of, of ex-Green Berets or war veterans of one sort or another, who in civilian life are <clears throat> assembled periodically to pull crimes against bad guys of one sort or another. And um, if this has at all a familiar ring to it and reminds you at all of the A-Team, uh, it was a, a <clears throat> terrible act of plagiarism on my part because I not only stole the idea from them, but I stole it about five years before they had it. <laughs> Uh, I decided life is too short for litigation and I didn't bother pursuing that, but there, there were some interesting parallels. Anyway, I, I uh, had, had the idea in mind and I talked it over with my agent and I wrote the first book in which the uh, various uh, participants and their one-legged colonel uh, work it all out and <clears throat> oh, rob a mafia bank in an effective way, whatever, and it worked out. And I sent it, uh, I delivered it to my agent. He delivered it to a publisher who was interested and the deal was made. And my agent called me up and said, so when do you think you'll do the next book? And I said, well, that's hard to say, uh, but I think probably never. <laughs> And he said, but I thought this was the first book of a series. And I said, well, I, I thought that too. Yeah. <laughs> he said, well, it, it turned out pretty well. Why don't you want to do another? I said, well, it turned out to be a kind of book that I like to read, but it did not turn out to be a kind of book that I really like to write. And I don't want to write any more of these. <laughs> He said, but I thought it was going to be the first book of a series. <laughs> and I said, Henry, you, you said that before. And he said, but, but, well, it's true. He said, I thought it was going to be the first book of a series. And I said, it is. It's a one book series. <laughs> 
So, so that's, that's the second series that I did. But others just, uh, <laughs> others happened of their own accord. Because I wrote something and I found myself sufficiently charmed by the characters that I wanted to do more with them. Uh, that was true with uh, the series that I write about a burglar, the Bernie Rodenbar books. And I wrote the first book called Burglars Can't Be Choosers. And um, it, uh, Random House published it. it. It didn't set the world on fire, but they were, they were pleased with it. And uh, I thought I'd like to write in that voice again. Uh, it, that book had come as a surprise to me in that I'd never set out to write, write something funny uh, in that particular book. And uh, because the opening situation, which I had in mind, was of some, a burglar, a very nonviolent fellow, who breaks into an apartment, and in the course of <clears throat> burglarizing it, he, the police come, and he goes quietly, as one does, and then they find a dead body in the next room. And he is startled and escapes, and then sets about you know, avoiding the police and finding out who did it, whatever. And uh, that the setup uh, didn't have to be funny, but um, I was just writing it, and it, it was a first-person book, and the voice was saying sort of funny things. And when he's racing to get away from the cops, and he goes out, and the doorman pulls the door open, and Bernie runs out and says, I'll take care of you at Christmas, you know. And, and I, really, I, th I thought, no, I can't, that, that's funny. And I thought, you know, just let it be. Let it go the way it goes. So here was a, an amusing character and certainly a, a much lighter kind of uh, book than uh, I'd been writing with uh, Matthew Scudder. And... Uh, other characters have, anyway, because I liked the way it went, I kept writing more books. And there have been about a dozen, 10, 11 or 12 of, of the burglar books. Um, another uh, series happened, oh, quite by accident. I wrote a short story called Answers to Soldier about a hitman who's dispatched to Roseburg, Oregon, to kill someone in the witness protection program. He's been identified by somebody, and the word comes down, and he's sent out there. And he makes the great mistake of getting to know the guy. You know, he has a conversation with him and everything, and this is not what he usually does. And meanwhile, while he's there, the guy has opened a print shop, you know, that the <clears throat> witness protection people have set him up in. And he's, uh... anyway, our fellow Keller starts having fantasies of living a similar life himself. In a town like this, he could retire, he could do that. He starts making plans in this area and stalling the people back in New York who wonder why the job isn't done. And gets pretty friendly with the, uh, the guy running the print shop. And then one day, Keller comes to his senses, kills the guy, and goes home. Um, which came as a surprise, I think, to some readers, whatever. It came as a surprise to Keller. Um, and, then, and that was a story, and I, I sent it off uh, to, uh, to Playboy, and, and they bought it, and it, uh, that was good. 
And I think it got an Edgar nomination. But I didn't, you know, that was it. That was all I had to say about Keller. Until one day I was sitting around and I was thinking about the story and I thought, you know, Keller, that sort of urban lonely guy, he's the kind of guy who would, you know, sooner or later go into therapy. <laughs> and I thought, that, that could be interesting. And it was. It was very interesting for me. And <clears throat> Keller did uh, get involved with a therapist. And a therapist who, whose ex-wife had a dog that the ther therapist liked and liked a lot more than he liked the ex-wife. And he manipulated Keller. He had the intention of manipulating Keller into killing the wife and all. Well, at the end of the book, uh, the end of the story. I hate to ruin it for you, but <laughs> the therapist was dead and Keller had a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, uh, that's kind of interesting, but he travels all the time. What's a hitman going to do with a dog? He's going to have to find someone to walk it. So the next story was called Dogs Walk, Plants Watered. And that was, that was interesting. And Keller met this very charming, uh, if flaky, dog water walker. And then one day she left and took the dog, you know. And, but there, were, there kept being other things that, uh, that Keller could do next. And I realized at one point, about seven or eight stories into it, that I was essentially writing a novel on the installment plan. <laughs> and in fact, when I had 10 stories and it was time to stitch them together, there was not even any editing to do between stories. It was as if... Uh, at, unconsciously perhaps I'd known all along I was writing a book and then there were <clears throat> there have been several more books about Keller since then and all because of one story that I thought was as much as I had to say about the fellow I've evidently found him endlessly fascinating I hope <laughs> other people have too perhaps and perhaps some have um, uh, <clears throat> another uh, well, there have been a lot of uh, things that have evolved this way. One uh, that was rather interesting uh, to me, if to no one else, was <coughs> uh, a book that grew out of a story in much the same way. I was asked to write a story for, no, it was for, for it was <laughs> <laughs> the editor who asked me to write it uh, was myself. I, <laughs> I undertook to edit an anthology for Akashic Books. They published the, the noir collections. It started with when they did a book called Brooklyn Noir, which was a collection of crime stories of one sort or another, uh, all set in Brooklyn and that. And that did well, and they went on. And at this point, I think they have something like 120 different books, you know. And some of the the the, <clears throat> the stories don't the settings you don't think of in the same breath with noir, you know. I I was waiting for their Westchester collection to be entitled Pleasant Film Noir. <laughs> But it, it's worked very well. It's been an, an enormously successful uh, operation for them, predicated on the notion that people like to read works set in their own uh, backyard. It's <clears throat> far easier to identify. And the result of this is that, has, that no end of writers have gotten a start writing short stories for various noir collections. 
it's, uh, that's worked very, very well. And it's been good for Akashic. Anyway, I was uh, <coughs> asked to do Manhattan Noir and had to write a story for it. And one of the gimmicks of the, these books is that each story is set in a different neighborhood. And I picked Hell's Kitchen, because that was no one else had. And I set a story there in which um, a young woman is drinking in a bar, and a guy picks her up and takes her home. And it, we're looking for something bad to happen to her. but. <clears throat> something bad indeed happens to him, and <clears throat> she takes off with his money and leaving his corpse in his apartment, and that was that, and it was a, satis it was a satisfactory story. There was, there was something I liked about the girl, I guess. <laughs> I didn't want to meet her. <laughs> but she seemed to work in this respect. And... Uh, so I, uh, I'm sorry if I'm a little halting and everything. I, I should tell you all, and it'll also explain the reason for the, the cane, is that I broke a hip back in May. No. Well, fortunately, one has two. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, I haven't been getting out, and in fact, I didn't know if I was going to, to be able to keep this gig, but as it turns out, I got past the walker it's, uh, a couple of, uh, about 10 days ago, and I'm using the cane. And it seems to be working out. So, um, but if I'm a little less than eloquent, that's, uh, that's part of the explanation. The other, I think, is that sort of brain damage that comes with advancing age, but we, we, <laughs> we needn't talk about that. Uh, anyway, I'd written the story about this girl and then my friend S.J. Roseanne was commissioned to do a book called Bronx Noir. And, uh, and she asked me to do a story, just as I had asked her to do a story for Manhattan Noir. Well, that was sort of an obligation, so I did. And I wound up writing a story about that same girl. So now she was up in the Bronx. <laughs> and I'd sort of forgotten that I'd written a story about her already. I mean, it was, I, I knew about the story, but I didn't quite realize uh, to what extent I was writing about her again. But the story worked out. And then another friend of mine, uh, <clears throat> Liz Martinez, had been uh, commissioned to write, uh, to front an anthology called Indian Country Noir. <laughs> <laughs> so my girl, <laughs> who still didn't have a name, who decided it was time to leave New York. <laughs> and she was now working at an Indian casino in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. And she met a gambler who was on a lucky streak, which ended rather abruptly. <laughs> And if I remember correctly, she scalped him. <laughs> and, well, she seemed to be my default character when I had to write something. And then I, I was invited to a collection. Um, I forget which one, what the name of the, uh, the collection was. Um, it was edited, or fronted anyway, by uh, Gardner Dozois and 
George R. R. Martin. And my story was about this girl again. Except now we got her whole backstory and found out what she was about and everything. And it was a longer story than usual. And once again, I found myself writing a novel. And uh, the book wound up being called Getting Off. And it was, uh, I think the publisher's caption on it was, uh, the subtitle was A Novel of Sex and Violence, <laughs> which, which was warranted. <laughs> and it was enormous fun to write, you know. And again, it, was just, uh, it happened because not once but three times I had to write a story, you know, which I didn't particularly want to do. And um, one thing led to another. Um, there's a principle in, uh, that gets more attention from graphic artists, I think, called Use the Accident. And things always happen other than one entirely intended when one's painting in that. And you, however, you generally have the opportunity to correct it when it isn't as you wanted. But use the accident means that before correcting it, consider if maybe this is a direction you would prefer to go, you know. So uh, I think I've certainly had enough accidents over the years, and I, I think I've been fortunate enough to use them to my advantage uh, a few times uh, down the line. Let me think what else I can talk about. Oh, it's just about time for me to stop, actually. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Let's use the accident. Uh, I would... Uh, I, I wanted to leave abundant time for uh, Q&A because I think I can speak probably more effectively in response to your questions and that, that way there's the chance that every time I do I might say something of interest at least to the person who answered the question, <laughs> if to no one else. So, so why, don't we, uh, why don't we do that? Thank you very, very much. You've been so nice to talk to. Pleasure to hear you speak today. I'm a longtime fan. Uh, in 1997, I'm sorry. In 1997, uh, Richard Stark, who is an acquaintance of uh, the late Donald Westlake, uh, returned from his 23-year, uh, I guess, to say, awoke from his 23-year slumber, and he treated me and a lot of us by resurrecting Parker in the novel Comeback. May I ask you to persuade an acquaintance of yours, Paul Cavanaugh? Uh, to pen another thriller, I uh, stumbled across a beat-up old paperback by Kavanaugh entitled The Triumph of Evil back in the 90s. I had no idea that, that, you, you, that you may know him. I had read some of your stuff beforehand. And the three books in that uh, series are incredible, and I would love to see another one. Um, and maybe you could talk about how that became a series. Thank you well, well, thank you. Thank you so much. The, the three books written under the name Paul Kavanaugh are not really a series in any, in any sense. They were just, um, all they have in common is the pen name on them. The first book in, uh, of, of the group, uh, Such Men Are Dangerous, that uh, <clears throat> the name of the protagonist was Paul Kavanaugh, and I used that as the, the name on the book, and there was the... Uh, fiction that <clears throat> it, it was uh, written by the protagonist himself. Uh, and then two other books, The Triumph of Evil and Not Coming Home to You, I also used that pen name. Um, when people asked me why I used pen names a lot in the early years, the only thing I can think of is that I was unconsciously trying to avoid building a following. It was... <laughs> It was certainly not a commercially sound idea. 
Um, and in recent years, well, in quite a few years ago, uh, I <clears throat> had the, uh, the three Paul Cavanaugh books republished, but under my own name, and they are available in that form now. Uh, so I don't, well, I certainly appreciate the, uh, the notion that uh, I, I might do more along those lines. I've reached a point in my life and career when, where I'm not that certain that I'm going to write anything uh, from, na from now on. I think, uh, you know, if something happens, that's fine. But I, I think of myself as uh, unlikely to, uh, to write uh, novels from now on. If, as I said, if it happens, that's fine, but I'm, I'm not really thinking it much in those terms. Yes. Yes, uh, well, I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm new to your body of work, and I'm here, thanks to my wife's a big fan, who brought me here today. But I'm, I'm struck by the uh, amazing uh, body of work that you have, and the length of time that it's spanned over the decades. And what I'm wondering is, these have been rather tumultuous times from the time you started writing to today. Uh, and one of the things that we have seen over that period of time is a decline of the printed word, the decline of newspapers, the decline of books until very recently, they seem to be making a comeback. And I'm just wondering over the, over the years whether that, these times and, 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 and sort of the decline of interest in books has affected your writing at all, or whether, as I think might be the case, you've just been able to ignore all that uh, and, and just continue to write what you want. Well, yeah, I've, I've never been affected particularly by uh, changes in the publishing world that way or, or, or the culture. Uh, uh, books have, there's never been a time in my lifetime when books have not been published and had an opportunity to find an audience. So, and I've never felt constrained from writing anything um, for reasons like that. So, uh, I don't, um, it's, you know, one, one could talk at length about the various changes going on in the world of self publishing, in ebooks, and all, all of that, but that would just bore us all. <laughs> Half to death, and uh, I'm not sure it would be germane. I, I've always written whatever felt as though I might be able to write it reasonably well. Yes. I uh, thank you. Thank you for your remarks. I guess I'm uh, interested in hearing you talk about your craft and if there are particular times of day you find yourself writing. I'm sorry. I missed oh, if there are particular times of day you find yourself writing, or uh, you know, kind of, I'd like to hear about writer's process, uh, approaching oh, sure. their writing. Okay, okay. okay. I, can, I can talk a little about that, because even if I'm not writing much right <clears throat> now, I, I can remember when I did. <laughs> uh, and there's never been an absolute, oh, way I've gone about it. But over the years, more often than not, I've gone away to work, either to a writer's colony of one sort or another, or simply to a, a hotel room in another city. Uh, and I've found uh, that sort of purposeful isolation to be very useful for me. Um, Georges Simenon, the Belgian, was most uh, famous for doing this sort of thing, and he had, he had a highly ritualized manner of going about it, and he would contrive to write a book, generally in around a dozen days, and, uh, and would you know, stop at the same newsstand every day for his packet of tobacco and so on. I had a feeling, I watched a documentary on, on Seminon, and I have a feeling he may have uh, embroidered a bit on, on his, his method. Uh, mine was, has never been that 
that ritualized. But that has uh, worked well for me to, uh, to get away with the work. And also uh, another thing that has been a constant for quite a few years is that I generally, when I'm working, uh, would make writing the first thing that I do in the day. Um, you know, oh, <clears throat> shortly after arising, I would, uh, I would sit down once at a typewriter, then at a computer, and so on. But that's, uh, that's about all. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you became a writer and, and whether the ideas just come out, or do you have to think, uh, think about the plot and the characters, or is it just, just, sure. just I come? Sure, I can talk about that. I, uh, you know, one of the things that's wrong with the world, or wrong with the way life works, is that we make our major <coughs> life decisions generally when we're too young to know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I, I was given very early, relatively early on, I, I, I know some people who started writing stories uh, about the, the time that they became capable of making sentences. Uh, Donald Westlake was writing little kid stories when he was a little kid. I, I didn't do that. But uh, when I was, I think about 15, it was my, uh, it was in the 11th grade, that's right, at uh, high school. And I got some kind of encouragement from, uh, from my English teacher. Um, I, and, and it was an earned encouragement. I was writing compositions and that that were, that I was enjoying writing and, and doing my best at. And I, I wrote one on career plans or whatever the topic was. And I concluded it, I remember this vividly enough, I concluded it with the line, one thing, I, I'm reading over what I've written, one thing does become <clears throat> clearer about my future career, and that's that I can never be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and she wrote on the bottom, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> and I looked at that. And I'd never thought of being a writer before that moment. And I never seriously considered anything else after that moment. You know, that was it. It, it suddenly had been revealed to me. And I knew I, I didn't want to uh, I didn't want to be a reporter. I didn't want to be a journalist. I didn't want to ask people questions they didn't want to answer. I didn't want to do any of that crap. I didn't want to be tied down with fact. I wanted to just sit in a room and make all this shit up. <laughs> and that's what writing fiction is. You just make it up and it works out. Yes? Uh, do you have any tried and true techniques to to keep the reader reading, to create suspense, and thank you. Um, no. <laughs> I, know, <clears throat> I know that uh, one principle that the science fiction writer Theodore Sturgeon uh, was, to my mind, the, the, the first to uh, enunciate was that if the writer doesn't know what's going to happen next, he needn't worry that the reader will know what's going to happen there. <laughs> now that's not invariably true, I found. There was uh, at least one occasion where I wrote a book and someone said, oh, you know, reading it on such and such a page, I knew that, and I thought, well, <clears throat> I wish to hell you'd told me. <laughs> because I got damn near to the end of that thing before I figured it out. <laughs> that happened frequently with, with the, the burglar books because they were, they're complicated deductive mysteries. 
um, and at least have the illusion of a carefully crafted plot. <laughs> and typically at the end, Bernie Rodenberg gathers all the, the suspects together into a room and says, I suppose you're wondering why I summoned you all here. <laughs> a sentence I've never tired of, I use it on. <laughs> and more often than not, I'm wondering at least as much as uh, the suspects may be, because I, I don't have to, I don't have an idea of how I'm going to work it out. I've, uh, it's a lot like, um, working without a net. Let's proceed. <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your opinions about Edward Hopper, um, if there are any of his paintings you particularly like oh. or his style. Oh, sure. Uh, that was a, a happy accident, and, and uh, we talked a little about how, how things happen spontaneously. I had no intention of uh, doing any more anthologies. I'd done a couple. Um, and, and rather enjoyed the process, but I wasn't looking for an anthology to do. And I was sitting uh, at my computer one day, and I thought of Hopper, who's, I don't know why we're getting this feedback, and uh, who was a painter I'd always found remarkably evocative and compelling. I've been to a couple of shows in New York uh, of his work. And I just thought, now how about if you got 15 or 20 writers each doing a story based on a different Hopper painting or inspired by a different Hopper painting? And I realized it was a terrific idea. And Almost immediately, the title came out of nowhere, In Sunlight or in Shadow, uh, stories inspired by the paintings of Edward Hopper. And I, uh, that day, I started making a list, of, a dream list of writers I would like to have for it. Now, you should understand that inviting a writer to contribute an original story to an anthology you have in mind is about as alluring as, uh, oh, giving him an opportunity to come look at a timeshare you have for sale. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, so I worked out a letter, an email. I think your phone might be ringing. I don't know if they can. Oh. Oh. That's what it was. <laughs> Remember, I, I said I should want to try to talk for about 35 minutes, something like that? <laughs> well, in its subtle way, my phone let me know what time it was, or tried to let me know what time it was. It let you know what time it was. Anyway, a, a, very, a truly surprising proportion of the writers that I invited responded immediately and said yes. Um, and they all were very much Hopper fans. Um, and I think I talk a little in the introduction about why th this might be the case. And it's certainly not that Hopper is uh, an illustrative painter in, in any respect. I don't think, he, <clears throat> rather, he is not a narrative painter in any sense. Um, the paintings don't tell stories. The paintings, to my mind, suggest that there's a story to be told, which is very different, and which uh, <clears throat> elicited some
terrific stories out of uh, a batch of uh, fine writers. So it was a pleasure to do, and uh, you know, writing stories for anthologies is a labor of love. It has to be a labor of love because there's not much other return for it. And editing an anthology is not all that different. It's uh, one of the slower ways to get rich. But I, I'm, I'm very pleased with the way the book turned out. Thanks. So my question might take you back to your youth. I actually graduated from that fine institution in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Uh -huh. It sent you on its way. Yes. And hardly ever seemed like a place that would send somebody on their way. And I was just curious about your experience. I noticed that some of your older books actually have dedications to people from Yellow Springs. Mm. I'm just curious about your experience. Well, my experience there was, was uh, not bad, but the thing is, I was there for two years. Then I, um, I <clears throat> went took an own plans uh, co-op job at uh, a literary agency in New York and realized right away that uh, I wasn't going to leave that after two or three months, and so I dropped out for, and stayed there for about a year. Then I did return to Antioch, but by that time, I was writing professionally. And um, I, I was, you know, I'd seen Paris, and <laughs> being down on the farm just wasn't, wasn't doing it for me. So, uh, <clears throat> so the, uh, and my uh, academic performance that last year was, uh, what you might expect, and I was, uh, it was suggested that maybe I would be happier elsewhere. <laughs> and it was the kind of letter where I could perhaps have talked my way back in, but I was so delighted that they... <laughs> there is a little thing that keeps flying around here, but that's all right. I don't think it'll hurt me. Uh, I may aspirate it, which would be un <laughs> almost as unpleasant for me as for it. <laughs> yes. Uh, hi. Thank you so much for, for your wonderful writing. I, uh, I really have enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, you're very welcome. Uh, one of the many things I like most is that you have so many different characters and they are all, they really are quite different. They're not, they seem like they're uh, very unique, each one. And I wonder if they ever, if, if you ever are, find yourself writing a Matthew Scudder novel and Bernie Rodenbar comes into your mind, if they ever have any interaction. And I also wonder if you've ever thought of having them meet. Um, I know that a couple of other uh, writers, uh, Robert Parker and J.A. Jance, for example, have had their, have several different characters that they write about and have actually had them meet in, uh, yeah. in their uh, writing. No. Um I, I don't like that. <laughs> uh, it's <clears throat> been suggested many times over the years, and each of my characters lives in his own fictional universe, and I want to kind of keep it that way. Um, and as far as something from one character percolating into another book when I'm writing it, no, if, if, if I'm concentrating and in a particular voice, it's it takes no effort to stay there. Uh, I've been a fan of yours for uh, 40 years or so, and I'm a writer, and uh, I learned how to write by studying uh, the people I like to read. So I studied a lot of your stuff uh, because I think you're terrific. Thank you, uh, I agree. <laughs> One of my favorite characters of yours is Evan Michael Tanner. And um, there's, 
there's something in all of your books that makes them feel very character driven. There are two schools of people who, who write, the people who are plot driven and the people who are character driven. And I was wondering if you could talk about how you developed Tanner and where the whole idea for the, uh, the thief who couldn't sleep and the secret agency. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I can do that. Uh, I'll, I'll say, um, for, for those who aren't familiar with, with Tanner, it's a character I wrote, I think, seven books about in the late 60s and early 70s, and then <clears throat> none at all until one in, I think, 1998, uh, an eighth book. And uh, Tanner is... Uh, a sort of freelance secret agent, as it were, um, who the back, his backstory is that he was wounded in the Korean War and a piece of shrapnel destroyed the sleep center in his brain and he's been awake ever since. Anyway, the way Tanner, I'll, I'll talk a little about uh, where the character came from. Um, it came from two things that I happened to learn from a reading at, at about the same time. And the synchronicity of this had a lot to do with the evolution of the character. First of all, I read something in Time Magazine in probably 63 or 4, that uh, there were, it was a, a whole article about sleep, and at the time it said, we don't really know why people sleep. Well, that of course was quite a few years ago and we still don't know really why people sleep. There's been a lot of progress in sleep science, but there's, there's still things that are unfathomable at present. But it also confided that there seemed to be a handful of people, documented cases in the world of people who literally did not sleep at all. I thought, well, that was interesting. And then I read another thing, I think browsing in the encyclopedia, this, it came to my attention, that there was still in existence an official pretender to the, the English, a, a Stuart pretender to the English throne. Now the house of Stuart, the last Stuart monarch was Anne, who died in 1714. And there was uh, <coughs> James, the elder pretender. And then there was the young pretender, Bonnie Prince Charlie. And when his, <coughs> his forces were defeated at the Battle of Culloden in 1745, that was essentially the end of the Jacobin movement, Jacobite movement. And I go into specifics on that and give you the dates and everything because I can. <laughs> what is the point of knowing useless information like that if you don't get to inflict it on others? <laughs> anyway, there still seemed to be in the mid 20th century a Stuart heir to the throne though he didn't make too much about it. it was, he was not gathering up forces to invade the Isle of Skye or anything. And I thought, suppose there was like a plot to restore the House of Stuart now in, in a book. And I thought, suppose at the heart of it was this guy I was thinking about who couldn't sleep because I'd thought about him some and thought, well, what would he do during all those extra hours? <laughs> well, if he were anything like me, he'd probably squander that extra eight hours a day the same as he did with the other 16. But I, I thought, well, he could learn languages. He could learn just about every language there is and he could do, do that and, and so on and so on. Anyway, I had a character in mind and uh, I had sort of a cause in mind, and that didn't add up to a book, so I forgot about it. And then uh, a couple of years later, I met a fellow 
named W. Lincoln Higgy, who was a numismatist, and who had earned a rather precarious living for the past several years. I met him in Racine, Wisconsin, where I was at the time and where he was visiting. And he'd been uh, smuggling rare coins and artifacts out of Turkey and selling them in Switzerland and, and doing that. And it was a rather precarious way to do it because if they caught you, they killed you. you know. But he hadn't been killed and he lived at least long enough to tell me some of his adventures. And one of them <coughs> included a whole background about a batch of guys from the Arab American Oil Company, Aramco, who were looking for a secreted hoard of gold left there by the Armenian community of Balakasir. You don't need to know any of this. And <laughs> anyway, I woke up, we had him over to the house in Racine, and he told me this story while the two of us made great indentations in a bottle of Bushmills, as I best recall. And what's remarkable is that I remembered this the next day. And I suddenly thought, that's what that guy who can't sleep anymore can do. He can be involved with all sorts of lost causes and, this, and, and so on. Anyway, that's where the book came from. Um, I'm glad that guy asked about Evan Tanner, because that's one of my favorite characters. But Thank you. I'm, I'm also wondering, um, what do you like to read? Um, obviously, if you're not going to write any more novels, unless they just happen, um, you're going to have more time on your hands. And I'm wondering what you'd like to pick up when you've got time. Um, who are some of your favorite authors? And do you stick with the, the hardcore crime whodunits? Or do you, ha you know, branch out? I guess is that you branch out because you seem to know a lot about the Tudors and the Stuarts and those people. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, in addition to not writing that much these days, I uh, have also have been finding myself reading a lot less in recent years. And uh, so, but you don't care about that. What you want me to do is tell you something that, I, that you might like to read, right? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, and I generally try to avoid that because of a long-standing policy uh, against ever saying anything nice about another living writer. <laughs> but, uh, well, the book that I was reading on the train on the way down here is the new book by John Sanford, whose work I like very, very much. So I'll just say that. Um, I think the microphone went away, <laughs> which suggests to me, subtle fellow that I am, that we're probably done with this phase. Thank you. Thank you so much, That's Mr. Block, on behalf of Arlington Public Library. It was wonderful having you here. Am I right about that? Thank you. <laughs> You guys, we'd like to invite you all one more pages here. If you'd like to have your book signed, if you'd just come right over here, Mr. Block will be kind enough to sign your book. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Mr. Block, watch that cord. I shall. How you doing? What's